in 2016, Grenfell Tower here in northwest London was given a £9 million refit. New central heating was installed and the outside of the building was fitted with new cladding. Yet a local residents action group claims throughout the process their concerns about fire safety risks relating to cluttered exits, lack of emergency access and faulty wiring were ignored by both the building owners, Kensington and Chelsea Tenant Management Organisation and the local authority, the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea. The cladding is used to improve insulation and make buildings look more attractive, but it's made of aluminium, a heat conducting material with a flammable core, which did nothing to halt the spread of the flames. It's been associated with a series of fires in Dubai, where the cladding is very common and forced authorities to change building regulations. On the 14th of June 2017, Grenfell Tower became a lethal inferno and the cladding has been blamed for the rapid spread of the fire. That fire at Grenfell killed 80 people or more and left hundreds homeless. But four months on, over 150 Grenfell households are still in hotels, despite the Prime Minister's promise for a speedy rehousing programme with everyone to be rehoused by August. In addition, only a fraction of the millions of pounds raised for survivors has actually been distributed. Even though the tragedy happened in July, the authorities have not passed on the generous donations from a shocked and kind general public. Is there any point in an inquiry? And how effective was the distribution of aid to the survivors? Simple questions with important answers. Some described the Grenfell Tower disaster as a result of gentrification. The cladding on the building is claimed to have made it look nicer in relation to the surrounding multi-million pound houses. If this building had been home to wealthy people, would the council have been more careful about health and safety? We put that to the public here in London. It's, uh, it's just how it is, you know. Everyone's getting separated with this social cleansing, even down to Port Villa Road. It's all changed, everything's changed around here. I believe it was murder and negligence, so yeah, if it was for millionaires, we'd have absolutely no problems with it. Definitely, yeah, <laughs> I think that's true. Um, I don't think this country looks after the most vulnerable people, and, and yeah, I think that Grenfell um, was a disaster waiting to happen and it could have been prevented. I think it's, uh, first of all, it's a sad stupid mistake it should have never happened I went there 24 hours afterwards and I couldn't believe that we lived in London 2017 in England in the UK uh, it's incredible how how people they don't care about people's life I mean I wouldn't be at all surprised if gentrification had a part to play but it's been clear that there's been a lot more buildings that have been discovered recently that have also had this problem so this seems to me a failure of government but certainly a failure of the local council as well that didn't look into it um, and I think that if there had been richer people living there they'd have been owning them and then they'd have made their own choices so. I think that probably because they could afford to the, 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 the rents would be higher so therefore they could spend that extra money. The council would definitely have been more careful and concerned about health and safety if Grenfell Tower was occupied by wealthy people. The fact is that the vast majority of the tenants in, in um, Grenfell Tower were um, BME people, were migrant people, black, Christian, Muslim, mixture of people, diverse people. Um, and they didn't care about their lives. They had repeatedly raised concerns over and over again over a long period of time about the fact that there were problems. Um, the school that was built at the foot of the building was going to block emergency services and actually that's what we saw. And some of the people that raised those concerns are now dead because they died in the fire. The council cared more about the people living in the surrounding area that were wealthy than they did about the people living in Grenfell Tower. Grenfell happened 
in a context in which Latimer and the social housing in the Nottingdale area was under threat. If you look around, and I'm sure you can get some GVs, you can look at the cranes that hover above the area from the Imperial development in White City and the Westfield development coming from Shepherd's Bush. There's a long-term plan that is about connecting through the Westway, uh, North Kensington to Hammersmith and Fulham and to that Westfield complex. And within that whole understanding, the Silchester estate was put under threat, the Lancaster West estate was put under threat. And when there was resistance to the demolition of Lancaster West, they went forward with the cladding work. And the cladding work, there was pressure exerted to reduce the cost of the cladding, which meant that multiple, I mean, that a cladding was used that shouldn't have gone above a third story on a 24 story block building. Right? Uh, Grenfell happened because there was purposeful degeneration of housing to socially cleanse this area so that rich wealthy people could come in. So no, it wouldn't have happened if there were rich people here because that's the reason it did happen. The last major inquiry in the UK was the Chilcot Inquiry. That took a very long time and was described as useless. Does the public think an inquiry is the right approach in the case of Grenfell? You shouldn't have an, an inquiry like anything else, you know. So, what do you think that inquiry can do? Bring people, get justice for the people, you know. Do you think that would happen without an inquiry? No, it won't. They're just going to try and brush it under the carpet like they do everything else. So, idiots up in charge that's supposed to be looking out for our safety they've completely neglected us and I believe it was a murder and it should have been treated like a murder like just because it's the council doesn't mean that the diffusion of responsibility is just allowed to be accepted no something should be done and yes I do I think that's exactly the rationale for holding an, an inquiry um, I think the Chilcot inquiry incidentally has really damaged the public's faith in the machinery of government and the machinery of inquiries in this country um, but my understanding is that those involved with the kind of governance of Grenfell are, are inclined to make this this inquiry kind of beyond reproach where the kind of quality of the investigation is concerned so I would certainly hope there is an inquiry but I certainly hope it would, it would put the uh, debacle of Chilcot behind us <laughs> that it will be handled correctly <laughs> why not um, I'm just used to the government lying, and I, and I also, I mean, it's a Tory government for a start, and they're not very good at helping the, the weak and vulnerable in our society. Obviously, because uh, there will be a cover-up, uh, because it, it means it's their failure if they do it properly, you know, and they, I don't think they would uh, like that. Um, yeah, but it's got to be quick. Um, you, you don't want something taking years. Uh, you want it as quickly as possible. So, yeah, an inquiry's right, but it's got to be a quick one. Um, I do have some faith in government inquiries, uh, and I think some change could come through uh, as long as the people really show that it means something to them and they want it, then I'm sure uh, some change can happen if, if there's an inquiry, yeah. I think that an inquiry is necessary as part of the process of justice, but there are other things, and those that are responsible for the death of all those people that died and all those people that are displaced actually have to be accountable, have to be punished for their crime, and an inquiry won't get that result, but there does need to be answers. There have been multiple problems with the inquiry itself. They held um, a series of consultation meetings over the summer. The first two they put outside of the area, which was not practical for people to get to. The second one, they brought it back into the community with the tower looming over the church where it took place. Um, they haven't listened to people's concerns. They tried to shut people down at those meetings and not answer their questions. And many of the people that have applied to have status for the inquiry have been denied that status. So they want to shut down certain voices who are representing the community. I mean, we can go for an inquiry, we can go for an inquest, uh, we can go for a criminal investigation. All of those things are necessary. All of them can run concurrently. There's no contradiction with doing those things. Is more BIX public inquiry extensive enough or the terms of reference wide enough to be able to do justice? I don't think so. Therefore, I think it's necessary for us to have our own process of justice that holds people to account on our terms 
and exerts pressure in a quasi-legal sense. And I know that a number of individuals are working on that to be able to maintain pressure from the street within legal terminology and understandings. We need to change the system. Uh, and at this moment in time, it doesn't look like Morbix inquiry will be wide enough to challenge the fundamentals in play. But if we consider all of those things, uh, what I think we will see with the public inquiry, like we did with other things like the McPherson report or the Scarman report, problematic within their time, they still became pegs in which we were able to talk about things like institutional racism or inner city deprivation, right? And so we, we may be able to address sub substantial issues around equality through this inquiry. Prime Minister Theresa May promised a three-week deadline for the survivors to be rehoused. Four months after the disaster, over 150 Grenfell households are still in hotels. How, in the public's view, does this affect the trust between the community and the government? Well, people are getting moved out the area, you know, people have got roots down here, you know, why should they have to move out? You know, it doesn't make no sense when they've got kids that go to school around here, your family, and now they want to send them out the borough and it's crazy. I think trust in government is at an all-time low um, and I think this is just another example of broken promises um, of a government that uh, claims to have people's interests at heart but systematically fails when it comes to making concrete changes. So um, yes, I think, I think it's another example of a, of a, of a, failure, of, uh, a failure of commitment um, and it's an absolute national, it's a disgrace, an absolute disgrace. I think she should have gone by now uh, because something like this, which is feasible, it's nothing impossible, but it's a lack of um, uh, of will, you know. If they are not being rehoused by now, it's a lack of will, that's all. I'm not sure I would trust anything that Theresa May had to say, and I think that these people have every right to stand up and demand proper justice. This is an incredibly rich borough, so come on, let's fork out and get these people housed. Um, yeah, it's not good. Uh, I wouldn't be very happy if I was in that situation. I'd be wanting to be housed as quickly as possible. So, yeah, it's not good, not good at all. Look, if, if she makes a promise that she's going to fix the situation after three weeks and it's been four months, that only shows that, that only shows um, how um, um, unable she is to do something like Brexit. Well, the community don't trust the government for multiple reasons. The failure to rehouse them in permanent housing being one of those crucial reasons. The fact is that it's been stuck in hotel rooms with whole families and crowded into one room um, is of impacting on mental health, it's impacting on relationships. But what people do not want to do, most of those people don't want to do, is to go into temporary housing, which is what's been offered, which is outside the borough, um, properties that don't have lifts, um, don't have enough rooms that are going to isolate them from their, their friends and family and community. And the, the stress of having to move and move again is um, not acceptable and people want permanent housing in the borough that's adequate, that meets their needs, where they're not going to have higher rents or council tax in addition. Uh, there's a number of things that you need to be, that one needs to be careful of when misreporting this. The government actually did honour their offers. They made offers. Right? People didn't take them. People don't want to go into another, count, into another tower block. People who fled a floor on the 16th or 17th floor never want to go back into that type of situation again. So if the council offers them that, they say no. Yeah? Um, there's limited housing stock within this area like there is in much of London now because of changes in housing policy. Therefore, there, are, oh, there is a limited stock, but the council have now dipped into their reserves and are now buying off the open market over... I think 230 million pounds worth of property, which is almost as much as the British government within a year, right? It's a radical program which would never have been seen before to be able to do these type of things. Now, uh, there are problems with it and there are a lack of trust, of course there are, but what it reveals is what neoliberalism's done to subsidize housing stock in deprived communities. What's the cost of this tragedy? Well, Grenfell Tower was covered in panels with a plastic core costing £22 per square metre. It's claimed the fire-resistant version would have cost £24 per square metre. That adds up to a total of £5,000 more for the whole building. 
Up to 30,000 buildings of varying heights are wrapped in the same cladding, leading fire experts to express serious concerns over their safety. Of course, the cost of this accident in deaths cannot be put into figures. The public gave help and donations when the disaster took place. The Red Cross received almost £19 million. However, by October 2017, only 15% of that money had been given to the survivors. What does the public think of that? Um, I just want to know what happened to the other five, six of it. Where, where's that all gone? Whose pocket did that go into? And what have they done to help? Like, just because you work for a charity doesn't mean that you have to coin every little bit. Like, the charity isn't in your pocket. The charity's there to help people. And if, if charities can't help, help people, then <laughs> we're stuffed. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a farce. Um, it's a great disappointment. It's a very poor reflection on, on once again, the machinery of, uh, of, of government and local government. Um, you know, my sense is that the, the, the infrastructure simply wasn't there. You know, the commitment was there to, 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 to get this money kind of, you know, to surface this money. Um, and there was no hesitation in people coming forward to give money. Um, but the infrastructure simply wasn't there to distribute it to those that needed it. And, uh, you know, I think that just shows a lack of, a lack of foresight, lack of planning, lack of resilience. Um, you know, it, again, a, a terrible failure, systematic failure, I think. Yeah, why? On? Where is that money gone? I mean, everyone I know gave money. We all, we all want to know, like, why isn't it going to the victims? <laughs> How do you feel about the fact that it hasn't been distributed? Absolutely appalled, outraged, disgusted. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's outrageous. Why is that? So that's what we need to be inquiring into. I do think there ought to be a standing committee of MPs that are looking into this fast, getting things sorted, the inquiry, a justice, uh, you know, the whole ju judicial process that needs to go through, I'm sure. But really, we should be taking a stand on this. And in fact, maybe Sadiq Khan should be making sure that he's got a, a committee up and running and looking after it. I'd want to know where the rest of the money's gone. Yeah. <laughs> That's about it really, isn't it? Where's the rest of the money gone? I would imagine that um, Britain being a very careful society, um, it seems like money is given out only after certain criteria is met. And um, I imagine that because the 152 families are of lower socioeconomic status, then they're going to have to tick all the boxes, whether they have disabled children, whether they uh, have one employ someone in one of the member of the family employed or two. Uh, but of course, uh, some of these criteria should be overlooked because these people are desperate after four months. Uh, I think it's disgusting that our uh, 19 million pounds worth of money is just sitting there. I think it's absolutely horrendous that good people, ordinary people, raise funds because they wanted it to go directly to those people that needed it there and then so they can have some dignity, purchase the things they needed. And there's been all this control over the funds and limitations and restrictions on who can get it, when you can get it, how much you can get it from other people controlling so-called charities in terms of the distribution. And the organisation that I'm part of, that Barrack is part of, the Umbrella BME Lawyers for Grenfell, have raised concerns directly with the Charity Commission about this and it needs to be scrutinised. Nobody should be having to struggle and suffer and not even have essential basic toiletries and clothing when that money is sitting there and it's supposed to be for them. It's standard disaster capitalism. Uh, a lot of money can be made through such a thing. It became a spectacle. Uh, a lot of people came down, there was a wonderful amount of goodwill, but the thing is that those who have the ability to take in that money like the Red Cross will take in that money like the Red Cross. The Kensington and Chelsea Foundation who was whose chairman was Tim Coleridge, who was part of the council team who approved the cladding. These are the kind of levels at which charity and local government overlap and what could be called corruption, if you wanted to frame it in such a lens. Now, it's within that kind of shock doctrine, disaster capitalism, that you can explain why people are help, why these funds are held back. But it's also classism. People are getting tiny bit part installments because there is a distrust of what working class communities will do with that type of money. And if you juxtapose it with what happened at the Manchester Arena at the Ariane Grande gig at the bombing, I believe every victim there got hundreds of thousands and the Grenfell. Where more money was taken, there's less. How does the public feel about the fact that tower blocks and buildings nationwide are still covered with the same flammable material as Grenfell Tower? 
just dreadful. It's dreadful. Everywhere else in Europe ban this, but this country has to take every, anything that's cheap, you know, and it's, it's not fair. It's not on. What are people saying about that, Rand? There's so many different mixed opinions about it, so, you know, people are not happy, put it that way. Well, I th don't think anyone was surprised when that came to light. Um, it's very, very sad what happened at Grenfell Tower. Um, I think the worry is it could happen anywhere else, and especially now we've now we've found that this cladding is, is used routinely elsewhere. It's a question of, of when rather than if, which I think is very, very sad. And I hope that's a wake-up call to those that really understand these things and have the power to do something about it locally and regionally. Well, it just needs to be um, changed, removed, like fixed. Sprinklers need to be installed. Yeah. They need to go all the way, invest like a lot of money and fix this problem. I think by then Labour would be in power because it's, it, it will happen if they don't do anything about it, sadly. Well, I think that it's clear that there was a breakdown somewhere along the line where we just were not careful enough about our planning permissions and our investigations into um, materials that are being used. It's part of the whole breakdown of really taking care of our society, in my view. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, they need to be immediately evacuated and uh, those buildings need to be completely refurbished and brought up to a safe standard. Uh, there's no reason why anyone should be living in a building with that cladding or anything similar to that cladding at all. Like. I think it's horrendous and it just shows that they don't see working uh, class people's lives as mattering. Um, you know, the, disproportionately those people, particularly in areas like London, will be BME people. Um, I myself lived in a tower block when my baby was born. Um, he's got now a grown man that I found out subsequently was one of those tower blocks that had the cladding on it. So it's really horrific to hear that. But we haven't seen enough action to remove the cladding. You know, it's like a long process. It's looking at um, buildings that are certain stories high first, rather than looking at all of them collectively across the board. And that just means that there's another Grenfell waiting to happen until they get rid of that cladding. Uh, Grenfell was built 40 odd years ago and dealt with many fires in the past because of the way the concrete was essentially a fire safety measure and would contain the fires within a certain amount of apartments in a worst case scenario. The cladding which cost over £10 million to put on the building in a regeneration project was the thing that then led to it becoming flammable and that is a national crisis because there are many buildings with cladding with an air gap and polyethylene on sto uh, higher stories than there should be. Uh, and we have to have a real national conversation about what deregulation within the fire industry, within health and safety standards and within fire precautions has done. But also on a local level, you have to look at the policies and practices of people who are in the po pocket of big developers. In this case, a Rockfield and Mellon, right? Now, Rockfield and Mellon made so many mistakes, you have to start to ask, were they mistakes or was this part of a policy of social and ethnic cleansing? The story of Grenfell Tower dates back to the 1980s. It's a story of urban gentrification across London. This has included the recent refit which the tower underwent to make the building look nicer in an area where many of the properties are worth millions and house the super rich. The cladding has already been banned in America for reasons of safety. By contrast, and four months on, the pace of the government's progress in rehousing the Grenfell Tower survivors is remarkably slow. Many people think this is another example of the recent history of social housing, a story of contempt for council tenants and the denigration of council homes. The scale of the tragedy here at Grenfell is singular but the underlying causes of the fire are deeply economic and political and a very public statement about a very divided society.